Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Development Reimagine Talk Series, presented by the Innovation and Global Development PhD program within the School for Future of Innovation in Society at the Arizona State University. My name is Denise Simmons, and I'm a first year student in the IGD doctorate program. I'm very happy and honored to be your moderator today. The IGD program sets a new standard for a research-based doctoral degree at Arizona State University. It allows students to gain both depth and breadth through the examination of issues that shed light on the failures and successes of global development. Organized by the students as part of their coursework, this talk series, Development Reimagined, provides critical opportunities for leadership, organization, planning, and implementation of events related to global development. The series is built around themes within global development. Last semester, our theme was development pioneers. This semester, our discussions are under the broader theme of energy, environment, sustainability, and of course, development. With the international goal of universal energy access, the world has to grapple with the implications of energy production, while at the same time, ensuring that there is sufficient energy for the world's seven and a half billion people. This topic, future of energy, environment, and sustainability in transitional economies is of immense importance to us all. Today, I'm very happy. We have lined up an exciting pair of panelists who are global change makers seeking solutions to 21st century challenges and actively driving the development agenda from their respective fields. The format of today's talk will be presentations from our panelists. Um, it seems as though Denise has some um, problems, so I will continue. Um, we expect these kinds of stuff. So we have actually, um, we've, we've come into, we have actually made some contingencies for this. I'm Patrick Etwaru. I'll continue with where Denise would have left off. Um, as from where she said, um, today we have lined up an exciting pair of panelists who are global change makers seeking solutions to 21st century challenges and actively driving development agenda from their respective fields. The format of today's talk would be the presentation of a panelist for about 20 minutes each. Afterwards, there would be a question and answer session. Kindly make a note of your questions during the presentation. And after the second presenter concludes, you may post your question questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you once again. And to introduce our speaker, the first speaker, um, we will have Ms. Aurel Ledel. Um, Aurel, could you start your introduction, please? Thank you, Patrick. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you a passionate and distinguished special specialist with over 40 years of experience in the energy field. He is our first speaker, Dr. Gary Dirks. Dr. Dirks is currently the Senior Director of the Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University. And he is also the Director, the Senior Director of Lightworks, a transdisciplinary initiative that capitalizes on ASU's strengths in solar energy and other light-inspired research. Dr. Dirks also has an impressive professional portfolio, which includes his 34 years spent as the president of BP Asia Pacific and the president of BP China. In China, he grew BP from an operation with fewer than 30 employees and no revenue to more than 1,300 employees and revenues of about 4 billion in 2008. In addition, Dr. Dirks has spent seven years as the director of ASU's Wrigley Institute and is also the Julie Wrigley Chair of Sustainable Practices and a professor of practice in the School of Sustainability. We are quite fortunate and honored 
to have such an experienced and highly regarded individual to share with us today his thoughts on the nexus among energy, environment, and sustainability. Three very pertinent issues, especially when considered from a development perspective. With these few introductory remarks, I'll now hand the spotlight over to Dr. Dirks to make his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Dirks. Thank you very much, Oral. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today and be able to speak to you. Um, let me bring my presentation up. Well, as I said, it's a real pleasure to be able to join today and speak with all of you. Um, I'm going to cover the notion of the energy transition uh, rather broadly in my remarks. Um, and I would like to begin by emphasizing that while there is a great deal of consensus about the need to address climate change, uh, energy accessibility, um, there is not so much consensus in the world on exactly what that means and what it means to accomplish an energy transition or a transformation. So this a rather silly portrayal of my title captures the idea that it is a very complicated process that we are facing now going forward. Uh, the guiding question that I'm going to be addressing is to provide some views on pathways to energy transition for nations with substantial fossil reserves. I want to emphasize that a lot of the remarks I'm going to be making are personal views. And I think that's important because there is a lot of controversy and there is a lot of variability in the way people feel energy transitions are going to work around the world and they won't be the same everywhere. So much of what you do here, and I'm going to be very forthright about it, is in fact people's personal views. So jumping right in, a few observations on pathways. First, I think it's important to uh, recognize that we're living in a time of a very profound variability, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity um, in virtually all aspects of life. And, and I think all we have to do is look at the way in which the pandemic has progressed and the way in which it's created great, great dislocations around the world to see that. Pathways into the energy future are not excluded. There is great VUCA, variability, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity around pathways forward. It's also important to note that no substantial political territory or, or entity has actually completed a transition. There are some that are getting closer because they have lots of, of uh, renewable energy available to them, but no, no one has, has transitioned yet. And therefore, to a degree, all pathways are speculation. I think it's important to, to also note how important it is that we do good science and we gain the insights that are very available to us through science. But science isn't going to tell us what we should do. It's going to be things like culture, history, economic context, social values and social goals that are going to define choices. And I, I say this because we hear often, well, let's follow the science. And that is important to follow the science. But science isn't going to tell us what to do. And every nation is going to be different. There's going to be great similarities from one part of the world to the next. Uh, from one country to the next, but there's going to be very important differences. So why are we actually discussing this? And the answer, in my opinion, is captured in this chart. This shows you annual emissions um, on the vertical axis versus years, um, projecting out to 2030 and what kind of emissions globally we might expect from carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. We are on the trajectory that you can see of the beige and blue, blue, uh, blue lines. We need to be on the green lines. Uh, this is a huge gap. 
there is global consensus that we have to address this gap and that we should keep emissions to the atmosphere below a level that would create a two degree C rise in temperature globally. You can see it's gonna take quite extraordinary action in order to achieve this goal. There are beginning to be strategic shifts that would suggest that some of the very big players understand the importance of moving towards reducing emissions. Here are headlines that I've picked out of newspapers from just this past month. BP, my former colleagues um, in the oil industry have withdrawn from three major blocks in Kazakhstan. I know, this, I know the strategic importance that was placed on these uh, just a decade ago. This is a big move. ExxonMobil has announced that they will be keeping their production rate at about 3.7 million barrels a day down from 5 million that they had originally projected for 2025. This is a huge strategic shift. And Saudi Arabia has made an announcement they want to be a leader in hydrogen. Saudi Arabia, as you know, has got one of the largest oil companies in, in the world and is a major producer and exporter of oil. Strategic shifts are happening. There are other important developments as well. I would point at the, the declines in the cost of renewable energy versus conventional. This is a little bit small. I'm not gonna go through the details, but you can see Solar, wind are now down towards the bottom end on the levelized cost of electricity. And that's the direct result of these extraordinary learning curves. The cost has come down dramatically for both wind and solar as a result of the experience that industry and governments have in deploying these renewable energy forms at scale. The same is true for batteries. This is lithium ion batteries showing the rate of decline, flow batteries and other type of batteries, the rate of decline there. So we now have options to deploy that are cost effective and they are renewable and they are options to create systems that are net zero or very low carbon emissions. I want to emphasize the importance of societal goals, because like I said earlier, the fact that science is improving, we've got more options, we can see more clearly what we have to, to achieve, how important all of that is. But societal goals are really what's going to define what the future pathways look like, because for most countries and most regions, energy is not a goal in and of itself. It's an instrumental goal. It helps support well-being of populations and the ability for populations to, slot, to thrive. Now, from my leading question, you will recall that I'm meant to address countries that are energy rich. For those countries, energy is a terminal goal. They want to produce energy. They want to be uh, gaining revenue, supporting the GDP of the country from energy. In countries where energy is a dominant component, component of, of GDP, this is a big shift that they have to be able to make. It's big, it's complicated, and it's not going to be easy. And in some large countries, it may not even be at the national level that the issues are large, it may be regional. So in the United States, we can manage the energy transition if we focus on it. In my particular state here in Arizona, there's gonna be some very serious dislocations, particularly in tribal areas that are highly dependent on coal and the production of energy from coal. So it can be both nat national and regional. And it is important to emphasize how important well-being and energy, or how important energy is to well-being. This is the Human Development Index, uh, which you can see summarized there in terms of health, education, living standards. And you can see how rapidly 
the human development index improves as basic access to energy and in particular to electricity is made available to populations. If you're much below five kilowatt hours per person, it is very hard to thrive. So energy is really important for well-being. I'd like to take a short sidetrack now into the idea of transitioning, and I'm going to use the kingdom of South, South um, I'm sorry, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia as an example. Here uh, from 2020 is the breakout of GDP, and you can see that 45% of the GDP is coming from mining and quarrying, and what that actually is, is oil and gas. So 45% of their GDP is at risk over the next two, three decades. Um, they have a plan. Um, the um, Crown Prince, um, Mohammed bin Salman, announced Vision 2030 about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and notice the core of it is to broaden the economic base and create jobs for Saudis substantially outside of the oil and gas industry. They're developing a plan. They know the importance of it. Now they have the wealth to do something like that. Here in Arizona, we just closed a major coal plant on the Navajo Nation. Um, 80, 80 to 85% of the income of the Hopi tribe is disappearing because of this. And a major part of the income for, our, for the Navajo Nation is impacted as well. There is no transition plan in place. Big contrast between what we did and what happened in Saudi Arabia. So let me say just a little bit in closing about pathways to energy transition. First, I think we have to keep in mind some core goals. We have to get net zero greenhouse gas emission. We have to, throughout the process, be affordable, reliable, and accessible. There can be no discontinuities. You saw in Texas here in the United States what happens when you have discontinuities. Major disruptions, people die, and it needs to be socially just. And I'm not necessarily in that order. We need to do these sorts of things. So returning then to this guiding question, what, what do we think, what do we need to be able to do? Well, number one, we have to have a plan to diversify. Countries that are heavily dependent on oil and gas, coal, need to diversify. They need social goals in particular, not to leave people behind, build on their legacy, build on culture of the country, allow the old and new systems to coexist. Discontinuities are very dangerous. We have to be able to maintain the reliability of the system throughout while the new system is replacing the old system. You use research and science, know what's possible what and what is not, and be flexible for new technology. And finally, create space for, so, for entrepreneurs to be able to innovate. And finally, and most importantly, embrace disagreement. Because as I've implied throughout this, this discussion in my presentation, there is no clear path forward for, every, any, for anyone. We're all going to be learning about this as we go. There's going to be disagreement. It's important not to marginalize disagreement, but to embrace it, to treat it as an important part of the process and be able to work with people to identify what works in your location. And so with that, I will uh, end my comments and, and take any clarifying questions if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Dirks, for your very enlightening presentation. I believe indeed you have pointed out for us a number of the countries such as the Saudi Arabia, and the US and showed, shown us how uh, two different countries have approached this uh, path to transitioning. You've pointed to the importance of planning and planning even when you're currently an oil rich country. Uh, I'm also 
think for, of another important point was your reference to science and to research. I think, and we've seen how the transition has occurred based on the new technologies that are available and also, of course, the price. Um, an excellent presentation. And I think in listening to you, I'm also uh, reminded of a management tool that we have that's referred to as adaptive management. So even though we may have a particular path, we have to look and see how we may need to adjust it as we move along. So thank you, Dr. Dirks. I believe we'll come to um, further questions a little later. I would like to now invite Mr. Davon Van Veen to introduce the second speaker, Dr. Paulette Bainer. Davon? Good evening, everyone. Tonight, it is my distinguished pleasure to introduce a phenomenal woman of many talents in the person of Dr. Paulette Bino. Dr. Bino is a senior lecturer and the former Dean of the Faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Guyana. Dr. Bino was awarded a PhD in Geography from the University of Sussex, UK, and has more than 25 years of interdisciplinary experience in environmental sciences and has taught courses included but not limited to community disaster risk management and environmental resources policy. Dr. Bino has researched and published in natural resources and environmental policy, sustainable livelihoods and climate change and disaster vulnerability and environmental policy. As an environmental practitioner, Dr. Bino has conducted more than 50 technical studies for national, regional and international organizations. For all of her accomplishments, Dr. Bino was officially recognized by the government of Guyana as she received the Golden Hour of Achievement from the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Dr. Bino currently serves in various capacities nationally, regionally, and nationally, including chair of the Green Engineering Panel for the Caribbean Examination Council and lead climate change negotiator for the post 77 in China for the year 2020. Dr. Bino, thank you for agreeing to come and share thoughts and experiences with us tonight. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Van Bean. Just let me try to share my screen before I continue. All right, first let me express heartfelt gratitude for this opportunity given to me by the organizers of this very timely uh, webinar, focusing on a very controversial, but yet uh, relevant uh, topic. I have been asked to look at or, or to share my perspectives on policy initiatives in this transition in uh, of Ghana to renewable energy. And so let me say that uh, definitely there they are views that I share and I really look forward to an interaction with the audience. So in the 20 minutes that have been allotted to me, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of energy to Guyana's economic social development, our current supply of energy, what are the general drivers of the transition to renewable energy and what are the challenges? Because of course you have to be able to overcome the challenges if you're going to transition. In some cases, people talk about uh, leapfrog and so it, it would be interesting uh, to, to be able to identify some of the issues there. And then to share my perspective on some policy initiatives and to identify barriers, because even as you talk about policy initiatives, you have to see what are the barriers that are there to be overcome. And, and not barriers meaning that they cannot be overcome, but barriers showing that, well, they are, there are obstacles in the way that can be moved. And then to talk about, to conclude with some imperative for success. So I think that we would all agree that energy system, energy services on a whole enable economic growth. And in fact, I want to recall the sustainable development goal number seven that talks about ensuring access to affordable, reliable, 
and the sustainable and modern energy for all. The government of Guyana, even as early as 2001, when the national development strategy was launched, talked about the importance of energy playing such a strategic role in the development of Guyana's economy. We also think of the budget speech that identified access to energy, affordable, adequate, and reliable energy as a means of social development, and of course, alleviation of poverty. The current supply of energy to Guyana, as you can see from the slide, we're heavily dependent on imported petroleum products, 80% primary energy. We have two electric grids, and then we have a number of isolated mini grids and biomass in the form of sugarcane um, bagasse and firewood that account for 90% of the primary energy, heat and electricity. Of course, there are vast resources to be harnessed in the form of renewable energy, solar, wind, hydropower, and biomass. Here I'm just showing the current supply, well, currently the sense is just uh, 2018, so it's not that outdated, but just to point out that three sectors really dominate the energy consumption, transport, industry, and agriculture, fishing, and mining. And this is important, esteemed uh, colleagues, because when you're talking about the transformation or the transition, I think it's important to understand which are the, the, the sectors that account significantly for the energy consumption. So if you're talking about a phase approach, maybe you want to concentrate to an extent on sectors that would help you to reduce the, the carbon footprints. But there are some key challenges that one has to overcome or a country would have to overcome. And I'm not going to highlight all, but just a few. The fact that there is this great dependence on the fossil fuel-based generation capability, inadequate generating capacity that results in supply shortfalls. We have a very poor transmission and, and distribution network. There's need for a large capital investment cost effectiveness of the domestic energy sources. And of course, the whole issue of indigenous technological capability in the energy supply systems. So what are the drivers of this transition to renewable energy? Because I think over the past, the last decade, there has really been an increase in recognition and buy-in for renewable energy. Societal push towards sustainability. My colleague would have identified or would have talked about the need for us to look at renewable energy as a means of mitigating climate change. So changing the energy resources or the energy sources will be fundamental in moving us toward a low carbon economy or zero emission economy. In that context, renewable energy and energy efficient measures can, can potentially achieve 90% of the required carbon reductions. We also know that there is a commitment to decarbonization and the policies to support that. In other words, if there is policy to help us to walk the talk, then the transition becomes easier. More competitiveness in respect of renewable energy. And this is related to the learning curve, the experiences, and how less costly it would be every time you try to implement renewable energy resources or technologies. Of course, renewable energy can allow for increased energy security, 
you have cost reduction, the whole issue of innovation. And, of, and if you want to build a more resilient energy system, it's important to look at that mix that would include the renewable energy sources. So I now move to a few of the, the perspective of my perspectives on the policy initiatives. And I want to make two general points. I think in, the, in this transition, it is important that our country articulates a very unambiguous policy with regard to our development trajectory. And in this context, I would just want to make note of the low carbon development strategy phase two that I think is currently being developed or will be developed soon. Once that is done and we have, we, we need to undertake a general review of Guyana's readiness for the renewable energy transition. Here, national goals must be set and based on those, the national targets, sorry. And once you set targets, then we must have the action plans that will allow us to achieve those targets. So what are some of the specific initiatives that I consider important to be included in this transition or for consideration? Already Guyana would have started an energy mix in terms of the renewable resources. So there should be a continuation that will allow us to depend less on imported petroleum products. I mentioned the issue of target. And so within the context of the elect Guyana's electricity sector, there should be clear targets that will transform the sector from nearly 100% fossil fuel base to almost entirely clean energy. And then the, the whole issue of decarbonizing the transport sector. Decarbonization of the transport sector is very important. Very, very important because there are a number of issues that one has to look at. For example, the availability of energy carriers and fuels produced from renewable sources. Now, the government would have already piloted the use of an electric vehicle as a means to inform research and development. And so I think this is heading in the right direction. But another important initiative to consider is the development of regulatory policies such as quotas and obligations and price instruments that would be supported by fiscal and financial incentives to increase investment. Renewable energy requires significant capital investment. And so I think it's important for the country to have the enabling environment that will encourage investment in this particular area to help with the transition. Of course, related to that will be investments in solar and wind systems from the, for the off-grid areas. We need target policy, uh, tailored policies and enabling regulatory measures that would help us to decentralize renewable energy. This would allow for increased access to modern energy services by 2030. And in keeping with the, the sustainable development goal number seven, because access to energy is critical for livelihoods. It's also critical for social development, particular, in particular in the hinterland of Guyana. So even the Guyana low carbon development strategy would have already mentioned, this is in phase one, the use of solar photovoltaic systems to about 15,000 households that do not have 
access to the national grid. There is need to create more opportunities for private sector investment. For example, and I think we all would agree that public-private partnerships are very important because this will allow for the promotion of efficiency, diversification, and infrastructure development, among others. But also, if we want to contribute to the global efforts to limit carbon footprints and particularly to keep the, the increase in temperature below two degrees, I think it's important to regulate the use of high carbon energy sources, perhaps with an environmental tax or a price on carbon. Research and development, my colleague would have already mentioned that, it's very critical. And so a policy must promote, should include grants and contracts and incentives that would be very attractive to private sectors, the university and other research institutions. There is need to promote and to provide support for training as a priority because I would have already talked about the limited human capital to develop the renewable energy and to take us along the transition. Other perspectives relate to behavioral change, because even when we talk about the transition to renewable energy, I think it's important to understand also the importance of energy efficiency. And so that calls for behavioral change. Also, if persons are not aware of the benefits that can be accrued from the use of renewable energy, then perhaps the attitudes towards the fossil fuel would not be changed. And then it would be difficult for us to have the public buy-in. Need, there's need for support for innovation and also the consideration of crop cross-cutting issues. So when we're talking about the transition to renewable energy, it is important to, to use a systems approach so that we can consider aspects of sustainability, ecological aspects, economic aspects, and social aspects, such as social inclusion, gender equity, and, and those sorts of things. Now, having said that, there are a number of barriers that would have to be overcome. And I've, hi I've highlighted quite a few here. Lack of sufficient information and knowledge about renewables, maybe flawed perceptions, the need for public acceptance. I would have mentioned the high capital or investment costs, the risk and uncertainties with technologies, where there is no in-country experience, post-development costs and time, particularly related to data collection for hydropower. So high penetration of the intermittent renewable energy sources that can cause uh, the grid stability, the cause issues related to grid stability and re the requirement for reserve power, costly energy storage systems. Others would be competing uses of land. This is very important because you do not want to transition to renewable energy at the expense of other land use activities that are critical to the social and economic development of the population. Limited public finance for renewable energy, the need for that robust regulatory framework there's a lack of performance standards for renewable energy technologies, and of course, the limited number of local specialists. So in, in wrapping up, what are some of the imperatives I consider critical for the success of this transition? First, promoting and maintaining the science policy interface. I promote, I support the use of science to inform policy. 
and in the policy making process, it is it's always important to have the diagnostic study done to understand what is the reality, what are the options, what are the trade offs, and what is best at a particular time. So the science policy interface is critical using interdisciplinary lens because it's not just about the environmental aspect, but the social and the economic aspects. And that will ensure sustainability. I also think colleagues that another imperative would be to conduct a sustainability appraisal of any re renewable energy deployment policy because we want we would want to know what would be consequences consequences that perhaps were not considered prior to the development of the policy so that sustainability appraisal should allow us to see how a renewable a renewable energy transition would impact other sectors. Would there be trade off? Would there be risk? What would be the consequences and how can we mitigate those consequences? We have to build human and institutional capacity, definitely modernize and optimize our fossil fuel based infrastructure. Another important aspect in the context of Guyana is to continue effective participation by all stakeholders. And I've listed a few here. We need a smart, integrated and expansive network. You would recall I talked about the lack of standards. And so the ISO uh, 5001 would be a good point of reference that we can look at. We need sustained public awareness programs that would include the importance of energy efficiency. And of course, because we're rolling out something that's new, we have to ensure that monitoring and evaluation is key or is vital to the whole process. Because they're in the policymaking process, when you monitor, you can go back to the drawing room and you can, you can, you can make some changes just to ensure that you're optimizing whatever, whatever intervention is being made. So this monitoring and evaluation should be a very important aspect of the policy. I've just highlighted the bibliography here, and I would like to thank Ms. Chevron Wood, who would have provided me access to some vital information on renewable energy in Guyana. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baino, for your passionate delivery on the issue of energy transition with a specific reference to Guyana. I, I, immediately from the presentations, we see some uh, synergies between what was presented earlier. For instance, the importance of science and technology. We've also heard of the importance of planning. So I believe we've heard two excellent presentations which complement e each other. And I would like to say an early thank you to our presenters. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now move on to the section or segment of this talk series that will allow you to participate. If you have not done this already, I encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Kindly type them. I have a team of my peers is working with me and they will relay the questions to the panelists, including any clarifications that you may have. I would like to begin by inviting my colleague, Duane, to share the first question. And this question should be coming from one of the students of the Innovation for Global Development Program. Duane? Hi, Dennis, thank you. So the first question here is from Garindra, and this question uh, may go to either of the panelists. So I may invite uh, Dr. Dirks to um, respond to this question. 
Uh, there are strong calls for participatory and bottom-up approaches for global development. What are some ways that the future of energy conforms to this? Well, that's a very good question. And I think it cuts to the heart of one of the deep debates that is going on within the, the energy space on how to go about the transition. And again, I want to emphasize from my comments that there is a great deal of uncertainty about how to proceed. And there are, there are broadly two, two extremes that frequently get talked about. One is a simple transition, meaning you try to surgically remove the fossil fuel elements of the energy system, replace them with low carbon um, and preferably zero carbon options, but nonetheless keep the basic structure the same, meaning there's very large energy companies in many parts of the world. The system tends to be very centralized um, and it would be characterized by very large facilities like very large solar energy fields or very large wind fields. That would be one extreme. But the other extreme is something that is much more organic, that would be much more locally driven and uh, based on local preferences and local, local social values. And in the ideal case would be regenerative. In other words, it would support community local development and in particular it would underpin incomes of low income people. Now, it is not at all clear whether we're going to be at one extreme or the other or some blend. But I think it's very important for policymakers to encourage as much bottom up as possible by inviting communities and inviting citizens into a conversation about the nature of the, their energy future and enable them to express their, their interests and their desires, um, enable them to express what they think would work best for them. Now we do, when we do that, we have to recognize that energy systems do have a big scope. Uh, electricity, for example, can be can be continental wide, or at least large chunks of the country can be connected by a grid. And those things have to be able to work together across large geographic areas. But I think it starts with, with local policymakers being willing to encourage open discussion at the local level about what kind of systems people want. Thanks, Dr. Dirks. And if I could just maybe inquire whether you think um, the transition to renewable by 2030 agenda, whether uh, to what extent do you think it is actually possible? So switching to uh, renewables by 2030, how possible do you think it is? Well, I think if you mean complete decarbonization, I think it's highly unlikely that that's achievable because just the sheer scale of the energy system, the amount of money that would need to be mobilized, the amount of equipment that would need to be manufactured and installed would make that goal exceedingly difficult, if not simply impossible. But I think a lot can be done by 2030. And I think that the important thing at the moment for, for decision makers to be pressing on is how do we build capacity and how do we begin ramping up as quickly as, can, as we can and create policies that encourage new investment and, and encourage deployment of renewable energy. Um, I think it's far more likely that we will be talking mid-century and maybe even a little bit beyond mid-century by the time we completely decarbonize. Uh, but 2030 seems very, very hard. Thank you, Dr. Dirks. Um, Diana, we have some more questions, please. Yes, we have a question for Dr. Bainu. This question is coming from Joshua Gobin. Uh, for a developing nation such as Diana, now an oil-producing nation, 
how would that country go about navigating the balance between achieving reduced fossil fuel production and transition to renewable energy? Thank you, Dan. It's a question I think that everybody keeps pondering. I want to go back to a point that I made earlier that first of all, it's important for the for Guyana to have an unambiguous policy towards uh, its trajectory for development. Now, if, if we look at the low carbon development strategy, 2009-2010, I think that we can use that as a point of reference so that monies had from the, the sale of, of the fuel, okay, should support building a more resilient energy system or more resilient energy systems in Guyana in the context of the climate change um, threat, in the context of the, the large percent, significantly large percentage of persons who don't have access to the grid. So you're not only considering the financial aspect, but you're also looking at other aspects of sustainability, social aspect, environmental aspects, economic aspects. And to me, there can be like a phased approach. So while you're, you, while you're building the, the capacity to transition to, to renewable energy, uh, a number of, of countries or a number of, of persons will talk about the more the cleaner energy, which would be natural gas that are less polluting. So perhaps even if one wants to talk about utilizing some of some some of the energy to alleviate the the sort of, of stress on on households in terms of access to energy services then it should be a very phased approach. And let me also say, Diana, that in the context of Guyana, there are, there are two challenges. One, as a transitioning country, because our transitioning economy, we already have barriers and challenges. Human capital, uh, we don't have the proper infrastructure, adequate and, and, and you know, modern infrastructure and those sorts of things. So it will take a while really to ensure that we have the infrastructure that would allow us to optimize the use of renewable energy. So it has to be a phased approach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lainan. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Dirks. It's coming from Chetwin Osborne. In light of the UN convention um, that many countries have are signatory to, such as the UNFCCC and the UNCCD, what other measures does developing countries, what other measures developing countries could explore to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Yes, that's a very good, very good question. And again, it's going to be very, very country specific uh, because it starts with what is your energy heritage? Uh, and Dr. Bino has touched on that, that point several times. It also is important to know what energy resources you have. Um, but my, my suggestion, whenever I find myself being asked questions like that, is that countries be clear about what commitments they've made under the IPCC, for example, uh, to reduce greenhouse gases, but then really focus on what their societal goals are and how making progress with the energy system supports their societal goals because this transition is going to require great social support in, in every country in the world that attempts to make the transition. And without bringing people along, and especially without leaving people behind because of the transition, um, they'll, the countries will really struggle. 
So they really need to focus on their own societal goals and how the new energy system can support their societal goals. Thanks, Dr. Thur. Um, Dr. Baino, would you like to also maybe respond to that question? I think it, it's, it would be critical really to have the enabling environment that would promote the public private sector partnership to, to assist with the modernization of the infrastructure that would be required for us to optimize renewable energy, uh, resource, energy sources. Also, I think that apart from the UNFCCC and the UNCCD, as well as the UNCBD, because they are all they are three inter interconnected multilateral environmental agreements, the issue of energy efficiency must be integrally incorporated incorporated into the policy because as i would have mentioned before even when you talk about energy uh, renewable energy you don't want persons to go around wasting energy so if we're talking about an energy mix you want to ensure that at all levels and in in various ways that energy is used efficiently so we have to look at what sort of incentives would be needed to ensure that we can have households access the sort of appliances, et cetera, that would promote energy efficiency. Very important. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Baino. Um, our next question, we will hear from Diana, who will relay that question first. Great. So the next question is for Dr. Dirks. Uh, how, it's from Trevor Beard. How do we in Guyana reconcile a transition to an oil producing country with a transition to renewable energy? Yes, well, I, I would, to a certain extent, defer to Dr. Bino, who is much more expert than I am around Guyana. But what I would, I, what I would say is that um, Guyana has every right to develop its energy resources. And as long as the world needs oil, and as long as there's a market for oil, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Guyana developing their resources and participating in and of course, in my country, we're a major oil producer and we do exactly that. The, the challenge, I think, for Guyana is to strike a balance between how they use those oil resources, and Dr. Vina mentioned natural, natural gas as an example, how they use those resources internal to the country, recognizing that no later than mid-century, you're going to want to be out of using those, or at least the world is going to be putting a lot of pressure on countries to be done using those resources and to be phasing out fossil fuels. So the, the real challenge and the real question for Guyana is to strike a balance between developing and using natural gas to accelerate the development of infrastructure in the country and to develop the economy in the country. Um, versus building up a longer term capability to supply your energy needs from renewable resources. That's a value judgment. I certainly wouldn't want to provide advice on, on how to strike that balance, but that is the balance that needs to be struck. Thanks, Dr. Dirk. Uh, Dr. Bino, a question, Duane, for our panelists. Yes, please. We have a question which is emailed from Simone. Uh, the question reads, there's a lot of work to be done, yes. What are some ways that citizens of a country uh, can be part of these plans to help with the switch to renewable energy? 
And I may ask uh, Dr. Dirks to respond to this question, please. Um, yeah, so I've touched on this this earlier, and and so has Dr. Vino in some of her comments. Um, to a certain degree, it depends on the way in which the the government officials um, choose to go about policy making. Um, but in the ideal case, there is a mechanism to allow stakeholder engagement processes. Uh, and during those stakeholder engagement processes, which may be in the form of town halls, or they may be in the form of formalized input um, through a variety of different mechanisms, for people to engage um, in those processes. Now, there's obviously other ways, too. You can become involved with um, NGOs. You can become in, engaged in programs that might be sponsored by business in the business community, something that might be sponsored by the university. So there's a ver variety of ways people can do that, but you really have to look at what, what the decision makers are, are looking for for input and the best way to get access to that process. Thank you, Dr. Dirk. Uh, we have another question for Dr. Bainu. This one is from Evan Berry. It says, how does a nation like Guyana, in which economic development policies are closely tied to fossil fuel extraction projects, how does it gather the political will to set ambitious decarbonization goals? How can a nation find the political will in such a climate? Thank you. I thank you. Now, earlier I talked about the importance of systems thinking, and that is why I mentioned that an imperative has to be that sustainability appraisal. Because when a particular policy decision is made, you have to look at how, what would be the consequences or how it would impact another policy or another sector. So once you have, if, if we try to, if, if we refer back to the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNCBD, the one on uh, bi the biological diversity and the one on, on desertification. So the three multilateral agreements and many other uh, multilateral agreements. What, what is the, the government's position and obligations that we, they would have signed on to? Because in the sustainability appraisal, you have to look at the, what policies you're making, whether it's energy or another uh, sector dealing with natural resources what you're going to do, how you're going to roll out a policy, and whether or not there will be negative consequences for the obligations that you would have signed on to. I think judging from the low carbon development strategy, there is clear articulation of the, the government to encourage or, or to facilitate a path that is low carbon and climate resilient. To move towards the low carbon path, energy has to play a dominant role. If we look at Guyana's second national communication to the, the UNFCCC secretariat, we know that it is the electricity sector that has the most significant uh, contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions in Guyana. So my point is that using systems thinking, once the policymakers have that political commitment and would have articulated that commitment at the highest level in UN negotiations, then it is for the country now to align the sectors to ensure that there are no negative consequences or that there are no risk significant risk 
opposed to the obligations. And I'm saying that my understanding is that there is a phase two of the low carbon development strategy. And therefore in the phase two, because phase one would have talked about the use of uh, hydroelectric power and so on. So in the phase two, renewable energy can play a significant role. And of course the proceeds, some of the proceeds from, from the oil can very well help to decarbonize our, our economy. Well, Dr. Bino, in your presentation, you would have mentioned the use of carbon tax as a means to reduce our carbon, carbon footprint. Uh, wouldn't this, wouldn't that result in higher energy prices? This question is coming from Benita Davis. Yes, it, it, it will, because, and, and we do know it will, I mean, it was just uh, an option, but bear in mind what I said, that in order to perhaps finalize policy initiatives, the, the science policy nexus must be seen. So in other words, the research has to be done. Now, it, it, it will cause higher prices for energy, but if that is a way, if, if that's a way to, if you want to say this incentivize, for, for example, uh, the private sector from using significant amounts of fossil fuel based energy sources, then it's really a positive because in environmental management, taxes are important because you use, in, you use incentives, yes. You have regulations, yes. But there are times when the economic instrument has a greater impact. Now, I'm not saying that that should be done initially if Guyana is able in the next decade or so to develop its infrastructure and to have a significant, uh, well, an, an enabling environment that can really promote renewable energy. So you put a lot of, of measures in place and you encourage forms and other stakeholders in the country to move along the path of renewable energy, but there is still that resistance. Then there are other instruments such as the carbon tax that I talked about. So it is not the first preference. It's, it's what, uh, you know, we talk about a soft approach. We talk about the carrot and the stick, right? But it is, it is an option that one can use, but you don't want to start with that option. So let me just say that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Dirks, uh, this question, this next question is for you and it comes from Chris Barton. Uh, even if countries have an interest in an energy transition, we must question whether oil companies do, for example, why would Exxon or BP participate in the transition? And does any intertwining of relatively powerful oil companies with relatively weak states via things like profit sharing con contracts results in a conflict of interest? Do these relationships weaken the abilities of states to push for a sustainable transition? Now, this is an extremely good question. Um, and historically, um, many of these big companies have in fact resisted any kind of transition. Um, now in, in the remarks I made, I mentioned two, com two big companies, um, one of which my former colleagues at BP have quite literally made a commitment to shift away from being an oil and gas company over time. Now we'll see how that turns out for them. Uh, shareholders haven't been terribly excited about this change, but they've made the commitment. 
And you mentioned Exxon, and Exxon has now said, we're reducing our ambitions to produce oil by a lot. Going from 5 million barrels a day to 3.7 is a big change in strategy. Now, my, my personal view is the world is now beyond the reach of private oil companies uh, getting in the way of the transition. And in fact, I think what we're going to see over the next couple of decades is most privately held oil companies are simply going to go out of business. Um, and that's going to be particularly true for the small and medium sized ones where there's just no particular economic reason for them to try to make themselves into anything else other than what they were and that's not viable and they'll simply go out of business. Some of the really big private ones um, may be able to make the shift. That's certainly what Shell is going to try to do. That's what Total is going to try to do. And I mentioned BP is trying to do that as well. Now, the really interesting question is, what are the big state companies going to do? Um, now, these, these are companies that are, are government agencies. They're inter, in, instruments of the state. Saudi Aramco, uh, PetroChina and China, um, some of the big Russian oil companies, Gazprom, for example. Um, these are effectively state entities. And countries are still being a little bit oblique about what they're expecting to do with their oil industries. I showed you the slide about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia wants to diversify. Um, they've got a long ways to go to implement that plan, um, but they have one. So my personal view is that um, oil companies, especially the private ones, are not going to be much of a barrier anymore. I think we're past that. State companies remains to be seen, but as Dr. Bino pointed out, uh, countries make commitments under these, under these international agreements. And one should assume in the first instance, they intend to meet those obligations, um, in which case the state oil companies will over time go out of business as well, or certainly get much smaller. Dr. Dirk, I have another question for you. This time it's from Abraham Tidwell. It, uh, it says, recognizing the U.S. focus of the National Laboratory's mission, what are your thoughts on what synergies exist to support energy transition in countries such as Guyana that are consummate with supporting U.S. domestic goals and objectives? Yes, another, another good question. Well, um, I've emphasized in the remarks that I've made thus far that every country is going to be a little bit different and every country needs to build on its legacy, taking into account its culture and the social preferences of the country. Now, having said that, um, there are not an infinite number of options for how to transition. Um, renewable energy is going to be the core of it solar and wind in particular, but in places that have it, geothermal and, and hydropower. Uh, there will probably be some nuclear in the mix um, in a lot of parts of the world. I think international cooperation, and that includes contributions coming from the United States where the national labs are in fact leaders along with uh, the big universities, the big research universities in creating energy options. I think international cooperation involving these groups is gonna be critically important. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel over and over and over. Uh, we should be sharing what we know among the family of nations. And my hope is that the United States will, going forward, take a very strong position. It says we're prepared to be cooperating with nations um, as, as they make transitions and we look for them to cooperate with us and share experiences. And I do want to emphasize that. I mentioned that we've not done well in, in the way we've handled coal communities. Well, there are places in the world that have. Germany has done a much better job than the United States in transitioning to coal communities. So there's a great deal we can learn from each other and, and I'm hopeful that the United States will play its role. We have many excellent questions and our presenters are responding very well to them. We will 
have about five more minutes of questions. And so I'll ask Duane to ask our next question. And then unfortunately, we will have to wind down this session, Duane. Yes, thank you. Uh, this question uh, is for Dr. Baino, and it reads, feasible, sorry, and this question is from Saeed Rajan. Uh, feasible, portable energy sources pose a huge challenge to the transportation sector. How can a social, economic, and cultural approach to transition support the development of necessary renewable energy technology for this sector? That one, uh, that's a very uh, difficult one for me to, to answer because I don't have sufficient knowledge. Uh, I'm not an engineer and I don't have sufficient knowledge on the transport sector. So this one, I'm going to have to ask Dr. Dirk to, to take. I don't want to appear as an expert on something that I have very little knowledge of. So I apologize for that. And I would like to ask Dr. Dirk to, Dirk to answer that. I'll, I'll be happy to give, a, a, give it a try. Can you repeat the question again so I'm clear that I understand it? Sure, I will. Feasible, portable energy sources pose a huge challenge to the transportation sector. How can a social, economic, and cultural approach to transition support the development of necessary renewable technology for this sector? Yes, um, very good question. And it, it, depends, um, it depends on the type of transportation you're talking about. So um, personal vehicles, for example, um, there are two major directions um, the development is going. Um, one dominating by a long ways at the moment, and that is electric vehicles that are supported by high performance batteries, typically lithium ion batteries. Um, and some interest in some places, in particular in Japan, in hydrogen vehicles, where hydrogen is produced by renewable sources, it's, it's kept on, on the car and is used in fuel cells to, to, gener to generate electricity for, for uh, an electric motor. There's also some interest in hydrogen power for trucks, long distance trucks, using similar kind of technology. Then there's public transportation. Um, and, and there, there's again, a variety of, of ways in which you could go about almost all of them being electric in some form. I'm not terribly sanguine about the future of biofuels, although there may be some places in the world that will use them. Uh, because they have good resources. So I think it's most likely electrification of some sort. Um, the systems we have are not that bad. Um, technically, they work. Uh, the, the issue is reducing costs. Electric vehicles for personal use are still a little bit too expensive, although they've been coming down fast. And with all the interest in automakers in, in both Big, big scale battery production and in producing electric vehicles, I think we can expect cost quality improvement. So I think we're on the right track. The, the, the challenge now is, in my opinion, then twofold. One is to get the cost down further, but then also to produce the infrastructure. Uh, there is still in most countries a limited infrastructure for recharging, for example. Uh, for hydrogen vehicles, there's virtually no infrastructure at all. So on the social side, I think it's promoting infrastructure development and then whatever can be done to reduce the costs. But I think we're on a quite a good, I think the world is actually on quite a good trajectory for, for transportation um, decarbonization. Thank you, Dr. Dirks. Um, Dr. Biner, we have a last question and we're going to ask you this question. Um, it's from Anna Pereira. It goes, does the Guyana Energy Agency collaborate with regional or international renewable energy agencies 
for assistance in assessing the threats and our opportunities for national development. The question is whether, did I, I'm sorry, I didn't get it clear. Is the question whether Guyana Energy Agency collaborates? Yes, does it collaborate with regional or international entity, entities for assistance in assessing threats and opportunities for national development? As, as far as I am aware, uh, the GEA does uh, collaborate with, with a number of, of international agencies, even through uh, CARICOM's energy, uh, energy unit that is headed by Dr. Devon Gardner. And I'm sure that the GA would have benefited from uh, whether training or just information in terms of uh, case studies or experiences, IRENA, uh, in terms of standards, they have the OLADE. On the CARICOM, you have the renewable, uh, there, there is, I, I don't recall the full name, but you have you have a unit that deals specifically with renewable energy. And so they, they are a number of, of institutions at the regional and international level that would have collaborated with, with the GEA. But of course, uh, the, the GEA itself, I think is the, the, the lead in terms of identifying the sort of domestic threats and risk because I do know that they, they undertake a research uh, several in, in several fronts uh, to help to, to inform uh, policies that emanate from that particular agency. Thank you to my question and answer facilitator team. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to the audience. We have a number of other excellent questions and I must apologize that we are unable to answer all of these questions. Um, we will do a recording of this session and we will send the recording to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the conclusion of our talk. Energy, as we heard, is a critical tool in economic as well as social development, and it will remain this way. As we've heard from our presenters, there's no one clear path to transitioning to renewable energy, although it is acknowledged that it is a path that must be taken and must be taken globally. We've heard from both panelists also that there are a number of ways in which they could, this could be done and there are a number of options. It is, or it would be specific to different countries based on their developmental goals, based on their current or their projected renewable energy uh, sources. It also depends on what are some of the other goals, for instance, their social goals and environmental um, targets. So it will be specific and we heard some very key points coming out from our presenters. We need to, first of all, develop a policy. We need to, of course, include others. So we've heard about the inclusion of academia. We've heard about the inclusion of the private sector. We also heard of the importance of science and technology. And as Dr. Baino indicated, we have to look at not only a hard approach or using penalties, but we also need to look at the soft approach. So we need to also ensure that our um, citizens are aware of the need to switch or transition to renewable energies. So colleagues, friends, I want to suggest that we all have a shared interest and therefore I encourage you to remain engaged in this course, this discourse of transitioning to renewable energy. I will now request Davon to deliver the very important role of delivering the vote of thanks, which will bring this session to a close. Thank you for joining us, Davon. This was truly a defining and riveting session that has brought to the fore some key issues that needs to be distilled by our policymakers with input from the people that are governed 
as they advance development in their principalities that they are entrusted to govern. However, a session like this would simply not be possible without support of key actors. On behalf of the IG604 Guyana cohort, we would first like to thank Dr. Baino and Dr. Dirks. We both know you have very hectic and dynamic schedules, and therefore we'd like to take, thank you for taking time to come and sit to have this 90 minute conversation with us. Thank you. We would also like to thank the ASU media team, a team who has held our hand throughout this entire process. Ms. Cynthia Dick and Ms. Melissa Waite, we say thank you. To our cheerleader and advisor who was there every step of the way from conception to execution, Professor Natra Chetri, we thank you for all of your support. Last, but by no stretch of the imagination the least, we would like to thank the audience, all 200 plus of you, who have volunteered to show up to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Your attendance indicates that we, that there are people out there who are interested in energy, environment, and sustainability in transitional economies. To the persons who ask questions, thank you very much. And to those who ask questions to which we simply did not have the time to answer, we apologize and thank you for your interest. If there's anyone we miss, I take this time to apologize for missing you, and at the same time, thank you for all of your support. Once again, thank you. Please enjoy the rest of your day and your week. You're dismissed.